What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's my guy, Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark, how you doing, my friend? Good, brother. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Busy as we get ready for the Christmas holiday. Now, RC, a lot of fighting this weekend. We're going to look back at that. We're also going to hand out some awards. Yep. And also, the voice of the Octagon, John Anik, stopped by is a little bit later. But first and foremost, Derek Lewis fought last weekend. Mm -hmm. And in classic Derek Lewis fashion, somebody got put to sleep <laughs> and the beast was unleashed. Dude, wasn't it crazy that going into that fight, Chris Dawkins was favored yeah. to beat Derek Lewis? It's like, at what point do people respect Derek Lewis for not only his skill, his knockout ability, but the fact that longtime veteran and a guy that ain't going nowhere. So these young up-and-coming guys, why are they favoring him? Over a Derek Lewis, a guy that's fought for the belt two times. I think you got to look at Derek Lewis and also see what it's looked like when he's had opportunities to fight for the belt, or even what it looked like against Francis Ngannou, who is obviously the champion right now. And I think when people see him against elite level competition, the DCs of the world, when you compare him to the Cyril Gans, who absolutely outclassed him, I think you start to kind of disrespect what he has accomplished, the type of people he has put out in the octagon. And watching Derek Lewis in that fight, and we were talking a little bit before the show, and I was asking you about all the Chris Dacus feints, you know, and I was like, well, yeah. first off like you fainting like day day on friday <laughs> after next you know what i'm saying this is not top flight security of the world craig and when you're fighting against a dude like Derek lewis and you let him get within range and he starts to have opportunities to touch you it changes the entire fight what i did love was that as long as chris stayed on the outside you can see Derek. he worked kicks right there was a roundhouse up top and he kept him off balance and we saw a little bit of that skill set dc that you just mentioned that i don't think people really give him credit credit for what they don't give him credit for is his athletic ability mm -hmm. right you always see Derek do those jumping kicks the jumping double kick and you're like wow he can actually do that I've been in there with Derek Lewis and I'm telling you the power is so real right you're constantly under the rest you're never at ease mm -hmm. when you're in front of him now one thing that I did one thing that Cyril did is we fought him on our terms if you fight him on his terms you're in trouble and you saw Chris Dawkins find himself in trouble whenever he got hurt, Ryan. Yeah. And he didn't disengage. He didn't try to wrestle. He didn't try to, like, create space. What he tried to do is throw with Derek Lewis. Right. You can't do that. You can't throw with the Black Beast. Because if in the in-between, when you're throwing and he's throwing, and you he get gets caught. there first, <laughs> you're done. Right. You're absolutely done. Right. And that's exactly what happened right here with that little short right hand. Mm -hmm. He was he heard Dawkins. Boom. Dawkins starts throwing with him on the edge, and then bang, he hits him with the punch and he slumps him. Look at his face, bro. Yeah. That only happens <laughs> but that, when Derek Lewis hits people. DC, they but, go out completely. But that's the other thing, too, though, DC, and we've talked about it on this show many times. When Derek Lewis hits you, that's a crisis. Right. Like 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 yeah. you, you are in crisis because now you realize what type of power the black beast has. And so it makes people kind of revert. You're either going to revert to, you know, your, your training or you're going to go to what feels natural to you. And so, you know, guys like you, you know, who are wrestlers and understand how to tie them up, how to disengage, how to get out of, you know, the, the, the striking match, at least for a second to get yourself back together. That's what y'all do. Cyril Gaon, he relied on his athleticism throughout the entire fight and kept Derek Lewis off balance, and but he frustrated him and, and fr frustrated right. him. He frustrated him. And it yep. seems like it seems like fighters like like you, fighters like Cyril Gaon, uh, fighters that can be patient with Derek Lewis, that can make Derek Lewis work, and 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 don't get in necessarily fights that he's comfortable in. He almost seems that mentally he starts to discourage himself. That, that, that mentally he gets to a point where he's like, ah man, you know, I don't know. And I think that's why he mentioned championship fights being five rounds because when guys yes. know they have five rounds right they can wear on you mentally and emotionally along with but physically and you don't have to go so fast and get in his wheelhouse but ryan that's kind of like that's kind of people that we know right that's kind of like us like louisiana people Derek's from new orleans originally yeah. but yeah. you know how people down south we're almost like the front runners a little bit, right? You get out ahead, and you can do anything. You start playing basketball, and the guy can't guard you, you're good. Right. The moment you 
it starts to go sideways, they get frustrated, and right. sometimes they kind of check out. And I feel right. like Derek is that guy. When Derek right. starts to get frustrated, he's like, ah, to hell with this. I'm good. Because even when we were fighting, right, mm -hmm. I would take him down, and I could feel him moving early, trying to do the right things. Right. But then as the fight went longer, he started to make mistakes because the frustration starts to show itself. Right. But Cyril got the same thing. Man. After a while with Cyril, it was almost like he wasn't trying to knock him out anymore. Yeah, enough was enough. He was enough. almost trying to survive, right? Yep. He was almost trying to survive until Cyril put him out of there. So it's a matter of him just keeping his mind. Now with Chris Dawkins, he's a guy that played him and fought him on his terms. Mm -hmm. And Derek does what he does. He puts you out. The guy is one of the best heavyweights we've seen in a long time. He is. But I think when people look at his limited skill set, they kind of overlook him. Yep. And those are the mistakes that young fighters also make. They're not knowledgeable enough for RC to know that you have to be very, very careful and patient when you fight Derek Lewis. And listen, you know, I know, I know people with one trick get a bad rap, right? Uh, I play with a yes. guy named Mike Wallace. He's from New Orleans as well. And Coach Tomlin would always put him on the screen. He's running by people, catching touchdowns. And Coach Tomlin would be looking at the screen, and he'd be like, there he is. He's a one-trick pony. And he'd, like, pause, like, three seconds and go, but it's a hell of a trick. And you know, and I think that I think <laughs> that's I, a good I, trick, right? I think <laughs> I think we're starting like like we're starting to miss that one. Derek Lewis isn't a one trick pony, but if we're he going not. to say he got one trick, that's a hell of a trick to have <laughs> when you could put yeah. people's lights out like that. And you mentioned fighting Derek Lewis and what it felt like when you were able to take him to the ground and that he worked a little bit early and he kind of got frustrated and you could see him start to make mistakes. You also fought Stipe Miocic in one of the biggest trilogies in UFC history. And that's a fight that Derek Lewis says that he wants. And so if the people want that fight, if Stipe agrees to that fight, what do you see that being? And honestly, do you think it will happen or should happen, DC? You know, honestly, RC, when you look at what Stipe has done since losing to Francis sitting out. It's worked before. I don't know if in today's landscape it works now. Now, if I'm Miocic, I'm fighting Derek Lewis because I think it's a favorable matchup for the champ or the former champion. I think that this matchup resembles the Francis matchup in fight number one because, as you've seen, Derek can struggle with the wrestling. Now, here's the issue. When Derek Lewis fought against, uh, I think it was, old, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, Alexander. I can't remember, I'm not going to say his last name, <laughs> but he tried to take him down over and over again. Right. I can't remember his name. It's like Oleg Shajik or something crazy it's like that. It's close enough. So, yes, that's why we need John Anik, and I'm glad he stopped by a little bit later. He'll, he'll correct he'll help me us on out. this right. Yes, he definitely will. But in that fight, he showed improvement. And then he came back and he fought Curtis Blades, and he showed even more right. improvement. In the wrestling. So now, as Derek has started to shore up that hole that was so big, how dangerous is he a fight for Stipe Miocic? Right. Do I think that it should happen? Yes. Because I do believe that at some point, Stipe is going to have to beat somebody before they put him back in there it seems for like a championship that. fight. Especially, yeah. With, yeah. especially with Jones hanging around now. Yeah, that's because, what I'm about to say. Dude, it's almost like he's third. It's almost like the guy's third now. It's like, you got Cyril gone first, RC, and it seems like Jones just hanging in the wings waiting for his opportunity. So I think in that time, Stipe needs to fight someone. Yeah, like if, if, if John Jones gets his life together at, at any point, he'll have the next opportunity to fight for the heavyweight championship. I don't see that, you know, going any other way. nothing's wrong with that. Yeah, I don't see that going any other way. nothing's wrong with that. Right. Nothing's wrong with him getting his title fight. Like, I mean, when you've accomplished what he's accomplished, then you kind of have the right to go up Right. And really find yourself in the championship fight. So, um, I mean, I mean, I we saw it. Wrong with it. Yeah, we, we saw it as recently, uh, even with someone going down in weight and a guy like Jose Aldo, you know, getting an opportunity yeah. to fight Piotr Jan, not, you know, based on your resume, based on history, based on your mm -hmm. reputation, you earn those things. And I say it all the time, man, listen, everybody should be treated fairly. But people should not be treated the same. Some people have more invested into my emotional bank account than others. And I'm going to let you do other things. And so when you look at John, he's that way. But we're talking about Stipe. You're talking about uh, Derek Lewis. Let's talk about uh -huh. another knockout artist. <laughs> Dude, Jake don't Paul. Call him that. Don't call him that. Don't, don't call him that. I mean, come on. Right, really? You actually just... You actually just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy's hey, hey you actually, we're gonna talk listen you actually, if we're gonna talk about 
if we're going to talk about some of the greatest don't knockout call artists, Duke. don't call some of the this. greatest <laughs> knockout artists of this decade, right, of the 2020s, <laughs> some of the greatest <laughs> knockout artists of the 2020s are guys like, you know, guys like Derek Lewis, man. Don't you say know. that crazy, man. Please no, stop. Not. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm saying, like, you know. We got we got guys like uh, like Derek Lewis. We have guys like Alex uh, Pereira. Um, you know, <laughs> you have guys like Charles Oliveira. And then on a very on a, a a very short list, you have to you know Sugar Sugar Sean O'Malley. And then at number five has to be Jake Paul, right? If we're just talking about 2020 2021, Dude. this guy's been, he's been putting guys to sleep. Like like what he said, man. He put down Tyron Woodley, right? Mm. Uh, who not only won look at, look the at, won the welterweight championship, mm. but he was the champion for years. Right, this guy he brought back an old social media craze. He started planking again, right? Oh. Tyron Woodley, what? I'm wrong. I'm wrong. You promised. You promised what? this morning. When I texted you this morning and asked you if you was going in on Tyron Woodley, you said no. And right now you making fun of that man. No, no, no. The, DC, making fun of that DC. Man. Don't you do that. Don't, don't you do that because Amanda on, lost man. and you're not scared no more. <laughs> don't you do that. Dog. Tyron? You call Jake Paul. You put Jake Paul in the same breath as Michelle Pajeda. Uh, you you put him in the same O'Malley, Francis Ngannou, Derek Lewis. Like you putting them in that category now, Ryan. Did you not Ryan, you out of your mind, dog? You're going too far. DC. Ryan, going too far, of Ryan. those people, of those people that you named, right? Of those people that you named. Who has knocked out more established UFC veterans in the fashion that they have than Jake Dude, Paul? That's crazy. You see, that's the problem. Like, this is the problem with those guys going to fight Jake Paul. Because look at what happens. Look, man, I got to be honest. I'm watching the fight on Saturday um, with, in Cheesecake Factory, streaming the fight on my phone. <laughs> and uh, Tyron's in there kind of doing his thing. He was. And then Jake Paul starts to kind of build some momentum. Bro, that right hand that he hit Tyron with. It was real. It was, it was actually pretty slick. It was excellent. Because what he did was he fainted at him, right? He fainted at T-Wood. T-Wood dropped his hand. So then when he threw the second one in the hand, dropped. It wasn't an overhand, right? It was a hook. It was a hook, yep. Not, 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 not RC. Not RC. That's how you know. <laughs> That's how you know he got the brother. Because... T Woods said he got me with the overhand right. He don't even know what hey. got it. That was the right. That hey, was right. hey, that's it's like Chris Tucker. Which one of y'all kicked me? Which one of y'all <laughs> kicked me in the face? Like, dog, he got him with a right hook. It was bad. He hit him so hard, dude. And then T Wood goes face down. Like, yeah. bro, T Wood's my boy. It's not, it's I, not I good. I love T Wood. Not a good look. Dude, that was not good. It's that's, not a good look. That's a bad look. So, and so you know what's worse? The, the after. I don't know what T Wood doing on social media. He posts, he posts a knockout. He make a contest about. It's like Jake Paul is beating these dudes so bad that they start to make fun of themselves. I don't it's think like, you know. You know what though? I, I you it's know I, I'm, I'm I'm starting to think though. DC is just about entertainment. No, no, right? Man, it's about that. because because think about it. Like they, the, the, these are not the things that happens, you know, with a Caleb Plant and uh, a Canelo, a Canelo Alvarez. We, you know, they we don't, don't see those things with uh, Tiafimo no. Lopez who just lost. And so no. there are these other things happening in boxing for people who are purists, right? Who are pugilist specialists. You know, might yep. you say like those people look at the the game a different way? But Jake Paul is entertaining, and I think he loops everyone into that. Like look at listen to Jake Paul's sound after the fight. They're entertainment continues that started Bro. with the Roley before the fight. I just knocked out a five-time UFC champion and embarrassed your whole company and please, please let me get Kamaru Usman. Please let me get Diaz. Please let me get Masvidal. Please let me get McGregor because I'm going to embarrass them too. I promise you that, Dana. I promise you that. You know what's craziest about that RC? I mean, he said, Dory my boss is coming through. You guys can sign one fight. I'll break each other in front of the world. I promise you that if you really want it, come get it. Now, what Masvidal's doing is kind of the same thing I did whenever this whole Jake Paul thing was going on with me. But 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 here's the difference, right? They're going to fight this kid under his rule set. Mm -hmm. This kid has all the time in the world to train. You're right. Kid has money. 
The kid has ways of improving. And honestly, he is much better than people want to give him credit for. Right. The kid can fight a little bit. But the reality is this. My biggest issue is these guys go in there to fight this dude. They they lose to him. Ben Askren was immediately almost making fun of himself. It's almost like you're so embarrassed that you lost to the Disney kid or the YouTuber <laughs> that you start to almost like become like self-depreciating. Hey, hey. It's bad. You just become bro, a caricature I, I, in his in his in no, his comic, bro. Hell? Bro, it's bad. Like it's bad what's happening to these dudes. And what's unfortunate is that I, I'm like I'm like the dude that keep Tyron got him this time. Tyron got him. You told him no way Tyron gonna beat this dude. He gonna lose. I'm like man, you're crazy. DC. This dude goes and knocks hey, the out. Man, it was bad. Once again, like most list, I was correct. But what we got to do is pay the bills, man. And for some reason, yes. they like you reading ads more than me. Makes my job no. easier. It makes your job easier. So this ad is brought to you by our good friends at Atlassian. Guys, no matter what you're trying to accomplish at work, it takes a team coming together to make it happen. Teams come in all shapes and sizes, but they are not always on the same page. Tools and processes often hold teams back by limiting visibility and the flow of information to make good decisions. Jira Service Management from Atlassian empowers IT teams to work together to deliver great service experiences at a high velocity. So Jira Sports Management helps teams of all sizes work together to deliver great service experience. IT development and business teams can use Jira Service Management to manage requests and respond to changes at lightning speed. Teams can customize service portals and workflows to support customer requests at scale through a single collaborative solution teams have better visibility into the work of others and information flows way more freely development and operations teams can manage changes with confidence jira service management empowers teams and guess what rc empowered teams deliver great service experiences so learn more at atlassian.com slash jira service management that is atlassian.com slash jira service management Ryan, one more time for the people in the back. Atlassian.com slash Jira Service Management. Now, RC. What a professional. I mean, you say, but for the people in the back, say Jira <laughs> Service <laughs> Management. <laughs> 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 oh, you know what I'm saying? RC. Now, it's time to get to some awards, baby. Okay. You know we love that. Okay. We love Let's get it. Awards. Let me pull my list out. So, for me, fight of the year. Max Holloway, put it on Calvin Cater. I, I don't know how this is fighting. I think it's performance of the year because Max Holloway did his damn thing. Now, Alexander Volkanovsky versus Brian Ortega. Remember the third round? One of the best third rounds of all time. Yep, yep. Fiorian and Corey Sanhagen down in the desert in Abu Dhabi was an absolute barn burner. Gaethje versus Chandler blew the roof off of Madison Square. And then Max Holloway and Yair Rodriguez one week later. If not for Gaethje Chandler... Put on an absolute a masterpiece of a fight in uh, the UFC Apex or RC. Talk to me about these fights, these great performances, and also give me a pick of fight of the year. I mean, so so first off, right, I'll just start with with, with Gaethje Chandler because that's going to be the one that people talk about, right? Back in Madison Square Garden, two dudes who said straight up, this is what we coming to do. We ain't running. We ain't backing up. It is what it is. Now, I do not know if this was the smart way to go about the fight, but it was fun for all of us to watch. Justin Gaethje eventually ends up winning in what was a great decision and what was a great show of sportsmanship afterwards and now setting Justin Gaethje up for a championship opportunity but when you look at this fight it was one of those fights that said you know what this is the UFC this, this, I, th I feel like though DC that's the one you might <laughs> pick though I feel like you might pick that one it is it is because I don't remember a fight over the course of this year that I was more like into in the moment because you felt like it was only a matter of time before Justin Gaethje put Michael Chandler out because we had just saw Charles Oliveira do it. Right. So you saw Chandler going into the fire. You saw Chandler yeah. really saying to hell with so many different avenues to try and get a victory and really taking the hardest course of action. Right. Th this was legitimately one of the most evenly contested fights and fun fights that we've seen for a long time. Now, Ryan, the beauty in that fight, though, was the setting was perfect. The yeah. crowd was, it was, perfect. It was perfect. The fight, it was, it was literally everything, all the ingredients needed for an instant classic was yeah. there. 
and those guys made that happen. Well, I mean, like you, so you keep looking at the list, Volker, uh, Alexander uh, Volkanovsky and Brian Ortega. They had probably one of the best rounds that we saw the entire year. It, it was back and forth. Ortega was finally getting an opportunity. They had submission <laughs> holes, guys getting out of submission, ground and pound, and everything. I thought I thought that 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 round was probably the best round we saw all yes. year. Round I, three was the round of the year, right? For sure, it was probably the best round we saw all year. And then you go back to Max and Calvin Qatar. I just remember this. Is all I remember about that fight, bro, Max. <laughs> Throwing one twos, right? Head movement Slipping. and talking to y'all oh on the goodness. side of the, of the octagon, right? Like that's what he I said, remember. I'm the best boxing. I'm the, all, right. He the varsity. I'm the best boxer right. in the UFC. I'm the varsity. Like, wow. And so, but <laughs> all those, I say all those things to say, I'm gonna go Max Holloway, Yair Rodriguez. Yeah. I dude. think now one, it didn't have the setting that Gaethje and uh, Chandler had, right? So it, was, it, wasn't yep. in, it wasn't in an arena that was packed. It didn't have that, that type of electricity. But I am a huge Max Holloway fan. And I think when it comes down to stand-up well, striking... Suck up to him, you suck up to him enough. I mean, Max, you suck up... You done sucked up to Max so much that y'all friends now. We I are friends. When that happened. We are friends. I don't know but, when that happened. But, you know, I, I hadn't seen Yair fight in, in a very long time, right? He hadn't had the opportunity to be in the octagon. And I kind of underestimated what, what his unorthodox kind of style would do to someone like Max. Like, we saw Max get get to the clinch, right? We saw Max attempt takedowns, right? Score takedowns and really take this fight and show that he was a mixed martial artist even more so than just the best boxer in the UFC. And so to me, that was the fight of the year. I get all the other stuff you're saying about uh, Justin yep. Gaethje and uh, Michael Chandler, but I just loved what happened inside the octagon with those two. You know, in that fight, RC, Max had to show us a different level. Yeah. He had to yeah. show us things that we don't normally see whenever he's fighting because Yair fought so well. So, yes, I do agree it was a great fight, but, bro, I am a fool for the story, right? Right. And I'm a fool for this. It's like WrestleMania. Like, I love <laughs> wrestling. Two dudes can wrestle on Monday Night Raw. And I will think the match is 10 times better because it's in WrestleMania. So right. I love the story. I love the setting. And I thought the setting is what really put it over the top for me. Well, uh, you know what it is? For Gaethje versus it, 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 It's the fact that as soon as you got to the UFC, they just started giving you big fights. They never made you Dude. work your way up. <laughs> You I were, was in the Coleman ARC. I've never been in anything less than a Coleman. I know event. that's what I'm first saying, bro. Event on Fox, first fight Coleman event on yeah. Fox. Yeah, like, hey man, let's go. Yeah, let's go. RC. Now let's go to our second knockout of the year, my guy. Yep. Look, 2021 had some crazy knockouts. Corey Sanhagen's knee on Frankie Edwards was crazy. crazy. The way Francis switched up the right hand to the left hand to knock out Stipe was nuts. Yep. Corey Masvidal got knocked out. Bad by Kamaru. Sleep, sleep. Rose Nama Yunus Ooh. with that beautiful front head kick Ooh. that put out Zhang Wei Li. And then Yuri Prohoshka hit that spinning elbow on my man Dominic Reyes. Dude, we have seen some insane knockouts this year. So look at that. Oh my god. I goodness. love it. Dude, yeah, I mean, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> if our hey we, RC. If only if those the award are real. goes to, and the award goes to RC. Who you got? You go first. <laughs> All right. For me. Frankie Edgar, when he fought Corey Sanhagen. Woo. Because listen, RC. Yeah. That was lightning, you too. You know Frankie. Dude, you know Frankie. And you know Frankie's going to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know Frankie's going to dart in and out. He even did it in his last fight against Chito Vera. Yeah. But he just got caught again. But, like, he darts in and out. So if you can time it with something nice, you may be able to do what Corey Sanhagen did. So for Sanhagen to be backing up, yep. knowing that Frankie's going to enter. <sighs> off his back foot, jump to the knee, Landed so beautifully, insane. And from honestly, again, the story, Ryan. Ryan, we sat in that apex, and they panned the camera away from Frankie. Yeah. So you yeah. guys couldn't see it. I've never heard this place more quiet. It Man. was you could hear a pin drop in there, dude. He was laying on his on his stomach for a good three minutes before uh, they they were able to, they got him up and sat him up and everything. It was brutal. It yes. was a highlight finish for me. I don't Knock out of the year. DC, I don't think people understand how hard that is to execute. Because, unlike yeah. you, 
I am not a professional fighter, but I do <laughs> frequent UFC gyms. And when I'm in there, I, I get to the bag and like I try all these things that I've seen happen on TV or that I've seen happen on ESPN Plus. And to just generate power on a flying knee when you are moving forward is difficult. So for Corey Sanhagen to be that quick, that sudden, that explosive, that accurate in that moment, I thought that was absolutely crazy. And who could forget Usman Masvidal, right? It's after the after the first fight when they had basically a foot stumping match against the octagon the whole fight. And now you pull you pull the arm down, come over with the straight, come over with the straight right. Rose shocks the world, right? Zhang Wei Li did. She didn't even know what happened. But, D.C., here's what I'm learning about you. You're a front-runner type guy, like you mentioned early on in the show. You go for the low-hanging fruit. You go for what's easy. Everybody knows it's Yuri Prohaska versus Dominique Reyes, that that is the knockout of the year. That's the knockout that, that, that put him on the map. We have to remember, Dominique Reyes was what? Two, two fights removed from fighting John Jones, right? This and, was a, um, and a lot of people thought he won. A lot of people but thought he, he got knocked. But he, he got knocked out bad by, by Jan, Jan, right? Yeah, like he got knocked yeah, out yeah. bad by Jan. Jan knocked him out. But but to me, my thought process was okay. This guy is going to regain it back, right? He's gonna he's gonna get back to that form that saw him get an opportunity to fight for the title against one of the greatest fighters of all time and actually push him to the brink. And when you saw the aggression, right? The violence. The precision that Yuri Prohaska was uh, uh, attacking him with, constantly going forward, throwing unorthodox strikes. I thought to, to land that and what ensued once it touched him was one of those things like it's, it's when somebody who believes that they're tough like me takes their remote and go, nah, <laughs> that ain't for me. Nah, they can, they can have that jump. I'm cool. <laughs> Ryan. You know? Ryan, you know, you know what to me about, <laughs> you know what to me about Yuri? It's like, it doesn't seem real. Right. It does not seem real that he is that reckless, that he that, that he does not care that much when he's in front of the scariest people in the world. He is in front of legit the most talented mixed martial artists in the world, and he goes and throws caution to the wind, Ryan, in every situation, my friend. He just does not care. He just goes and does his thing, and that fight against Dominic Reyes was absolute proof of that. That it bro. don't matter who's in front of this dude. Hey, RC, I saw this dude in Abu Dhabi. So he's explosive. big, bro. He's tall, right? Yeah. You gotta be 6'4. DC. I cannot believe the size of Prohashka. DC, you was the only tall little person that ever won a light heavyweight <laughs> or heavyweight championship. He was big. I couldn't believe how tall he was. He's taller than Stipe. He's a big dude, bro. Right. And the fact that I thought he was big, even though he was weighing in as the alternate yeah. at 205, tells you how big your Prohashka really is. And honestly, he is a tough matchup for the new champ, Glover Teixeira. Um, Ryan, let's get to the next one, my friend. That's going to be submission of the year. Now, here are our contenders. Umar Nurmagomedov choking out Marazov, doing it better in his UFC debut than Habib. That's kind of the story. Fluffy Hernandez choking out Hadolfo Vieira, who is a multiple-time world champion in jiu-jitsu. Yep. Islam Makhachev. And the beautiful arm triangle of Drew Dober. Well, we know who you're going to pick. Luque? How about Vicente Luque submitting the boy Tyron Woodley? Boy, Tyron Woodley is on the bad end of a lot of people's highlight videos. And Brandon Moreno, rear naked choke with Davidson Figueroa to become the flyweight champion of the world after an absolute Can I go first this time? piece of a performance. RC, you got it. Hit it, my friend. I want to go first. And for me, it is the Lego King, Brandon Marino, submitting okay. Davidson, okay. Figueredo. Hey, bro, first fight, instant classic, right? Instant yes. classic. And, yes. it, and as you think about, like, it was throughout COVID where if you were truly locked into the UFC, you learned what a dangerous man Davidson Figueredo was. Right. And so yep. then and so then you're fighting Brandon Marino, a guy who had who had lost his UFC contract, who had to fight his way all the way back, who had this cool style yep. to me of just moving his hands like this. Right. Being calm. And it was an absolute war in the first fight. They fight to the draw. They run it back from the beginning of that fight. Brandon Marino looked like the dude that thought he was the champion. He looked like the person that thought he was supposed to walk out of that octagon with the championship belt. And then to beat him on his feet early on in that fight, then take him to the ground, get the rear naked choke, 
and submit Davidson Figueredo in that type of in that type of moment, right? With that type of journey, like you're talking about stories, it's not necessarily to me what the submission actually was. It's what the submission meant, right? It's, the, it's you the, know, Brandon. Mar- go ahead. I'm sorry, you, no, go ahead, brother. Brandon Moreno fought behind a beautiful jab in that fight. Yes. Like his jab was on fire to start, but for me, honestly. I got a different one, RC, and I'm not. Hey, look, look, look. <laughs> I mean, I got RC. I got a different one, Doug. Is not, and his name does not start with an N. His name does not start with an M. It's not neither Nurmega Medoff or Makhachev. Okay, I feel better. Neither of those for me. Okay, are right, you better? You tap back in. I tap back you in. Tapped out, you tap back in. I was going on okay. you. I was going. You about to tap out? Fluffy Hernandez submitted Adolfo Vieira. Really? Bro, Fluffy, dude, we're, if you know who Adolfo Vieira is, this is why this was so important. Fluffy Hernandez took this fight on short notice. Okay. He was fighting against a Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert in Adolfo Vieira. He guillotine chokes him. Yeah. Adolfo Vieira was more fatigued than any human being I've ever seen. You, you think Amanda Nunes was tired? <laughs> Put, you know, you think Amanda Nunes got tired there? Adolfo Vieira was five times more fatigued than Amanda Nunes. Adolfo Vieira walked in there with a 20-pound weight vest on his back, trying to fight right. in the octagon. I have never in my life seen anything like this. A guy that is so talented put himself in that position to get submitted. And, bro, before the fight, Rogan and I are just dude, we're right. tooting his horn in terms of his grappling skills. And then and he, gets, hey, he choked. Then he, he gets, gets choked out. <laughs> DC, when you but you talked about the fatigue though, DC. Bro, is, is, is that something you saw coming in that fight? No, bro? no, that's the problem. You know, there's a saying that said fatigues make makes cowards, cowards of us all. all. Yeah, right. We've all heard that before. It was never more evident than in this fight. And I don't want Adolfo Vieira to be mad at me because he got that look, bro. If if Tyron Woodley can pose the knockout and Ben Askren can pose the knockout yeah. the way. The only one that didn't is Nate Robinson. Like, I'm glad Nate right. Robinson is like, yo, I'm not I posting I ain't doing this. that. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Right, I I'm not you. posting this. Right? Dude, Adolfo Vieira has to laugh at that and say, you know what? It could never happen again. Right. Because I know I'm better, and I will make sure I'm more prepared when I go into the octagon. DC, speaking of... It was of, bad, son. You know what? Speaking of, 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 of prepared, DC, and speaking... Of, of, of people who who are stars, right, and people we expect a ton from. Uh, we gonna bring on John Anik, man, and I've oh, worked with boy? you. I've worked with you long enough to know how special John Anik has to be at his job in order to keep you and Joe Rogan at bay, and still be excellent at what he does. That somebody hey, like me boy. who don't understand a lot can understand exactly what's happening in the fight. Everybody, RC, man, look at my boy's shirt. Look at my boy's shirt right there. The Daniel. Cormier Wrestling Academy, located where, John Anik? Oh, Gilroy, California. We're trying to get ass back on the program, right? We're trying to get ass back on DC and RC. DC. Even though we think Ryan Clark probably deserves top billing and we should go RC and DC. Oh, but yeah. Thank, you, thank you. you. RC, DC. It just has the right ring to it, John. And and uh, very Brian, much Brian. very much like every show that you guys do together, John, I carry DC as well. People don't understand how heavy that is for us, John. Like, we have that in common, bro. How do you do it? How do you deal with DC and Joe Rogan and Mike and Michael Bisping, man? How do you do it? Stay so classy, so cool, uh, so perfect throughout the entire fight night. Well, you're too kind, man. I appreciate it. You know, I've had 10 years in the UFC. I probably work with 15 or 16 different broadcast combinations, but... You know, seems like it's in vogue for everybody to be banging on DC these days. So I'm not going to lean too heavily into that. You know, that's what this show's about, John. I know, I know. No, and he, you know, it's not even that he's that easy a target. You know, I think he's getting too much love, so people are trying to check him. But uh, (laughs) this is me showing my support, and obviously, you know, he brings a ton to the table on your show and the broadcast. But yeah, man, I mean, sometimes I just got to lay back and sort of let the personality shine and let the yeah. analyst shine. And if that means that I don't say anything for two minutes, you know, um, thankfully I, you know, am willing to do that um, and let the true star shine, I guess, you know. Man, you're absolutely amazing. John, man. You're, 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 John you're an absolute star, my brother. Yeah. And honestly, John, I, I saw the internet is undefeated always. And the one thing that I got from when Joe and I were going nuts is 
John, John, Joe, and I are in a group message, and we were talking about the call of the Amanda Nunes fight. Right. And I said, I said this thing that said somebody said a spaceship could land in the middle of the octagon, and it gonna tell you it was brought to you by P three because the guy's an absolute pro. John, hey, he, he gonna is stay on brand, pro. bro. Oh, he gonna, hey, he is an absolute well, pro's pro. Now, John, we have called some great fights this year, my friend. What for you is the one that stands out? At the top of it, you know, on the paper, is it a pay per view? Is it a fight night? What is John Anik, the voice of the Octagon, favorite event of the year? So there might be a recency bias when it comes to UFC 269, right? But I don't know how I could find a live event that I would put above it. You know, and I went searching today. I wanted to make sure that the first UFC live event on ABC actually happened in 2021 because it was so long ago. And that ABC show isn't getting the love that it deserves as far as this event of the year conversation is concerned. But UFC 269, I mean, what else can you say about some of the individual performers on the prelims and then what Juliana Pena and Charles yeah. Oliveira were able to do in a championship setting? Uh, I know it happened a couple of weeks ago, champ, but, you know, we're trying to dole out the hardware. It's a meritocracy. I mean, that's the event of the year <laughs> for me. Now, nah, you know what you got? Hey, you know what? You know, I, I, I like that one. I like that one. I think when... You put in everything that went into that night, the anticipation of having to wait to, to, to see the, the GOAT of, of what we called women's fighter get an opportunity to put her belt up against Juliana Pena, and she do exactly what she said she was going to do. I think I would have to go with John again, and really, DC, what I'm doing is showing him how agreeable I could be on <laughs> a broadcast, this just dude. in case you get a little tired, DC, and they need to slip <laughs> me in there, bro. John, this dude here, just all my friends, he takes from me. He, like, suck up to all my friends, and y'all end up his friends, and I'm on the outside. Now, for me, it was this one. So I was, I, I, I wanted to be like, yo, Poirier versus McGregor, too, because I like to spoil movies, and I like whenever the ending doesn't really turn out the way people <laughs> expect. But, though, I'm going back to Madison. I'm going yeah. back to Madison Square. I'm going back to Madison Square. That fight card was crazy. The garden was on fire. And then for me, J.A., when you start the pay-per-view with Gaethje and Chandler, and then you end with Nama Yunus, and then Usman Covington putting on another one of those fantastic fights. But again, I'm all about the story. Like, that's my problem. It's like, I love the build. So that's why I'm going back to Madison Square Garden for my event of the year. It was a fun one. Maybe it didn't have the the the, the finishes like yeah. Oliveira did with Dustin and yeah. Amanda Nunez, but for me it was it, it was getting back into Madison Square. And John, we got to live a little bit normal in New York City, right? When you show the vaccine card, you can go into the rest. It was good. <laughs> That's a big part of it, right? And Daniel and I obviously spent a lot of time in Abu Dhabi in 2020 and 2021. And some of those live events, and I say this with all respect, kind of meshed together, right? Yeah. For the first time, McGregor Poirier 2, we had fans in the building, but mm -hmm. only 3,000 fans. So when you're talking about event of the year and the magnitude and the pageantry of it, um, I think fans are kind of a prerequisite. Like, it was crazy to me that DC and Stipe completed their trilogy at the goddamn UFC Apex. The fact right. that Francis Ngannou, if <laughs> right. I'm not mistaken, yeah. um, broke through and became yeah. a heavyweight champ at yep. the Apex. Is that true? Yep. So, yeah, he did. You know, yeah, was, I think yeah. fans are a big part different. of it. It's, it's, it was it's, different to watch him become the champ there, but John, it was also... Uh, a spe we, we've had some special moments there, but like you said, the fans really change yeah. the energy of these UFC events. And, dude, the, the reactions that after those fights with the fans behind us unmatched. Now, let's get to this one. Now, I love the story. Oh, My boy gosh. Ryan loves it. Ryan, Ryan Clark is about as messy a person as I know. <laughs> so he loves a good storyline, uh, John. So for you, what's the storyline of 2021? Well, you know, it's interesting. 20 years ago in the great city of Boston, Massachusetts, Rick Pitino, then head coach of the Celtics, took to the podium and he said, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish aren't walking through that door. And oftentimes, right. Dana White is asked, man, oh, you know, Cormier's out, Anderson Silva's gone, John Jones has maybe one foot out the door. Where's the next superstar going to come from? And then a couple years ago, it was Israel Adesanya. It was the right. emergence of Jorge Masvidal. The cupboard is the furthest thing from bear, right? You look at the emergence this year. Kamza Chimaev and Sugar Sean O'Malley obviously predate 2021. But Ian Gary and Patty Pimblett, the star power mm -hmm. across the UFC right now is absolutely absurd. And when you look at the depth that we have, and I probably shouldn't say we, but the depth that the UFC has, flyweight through welterweight, 
top 20, 25, uh, it's an embarrassment of riches. So I guess my thesis statement on the year is that just when you think that maybe there isn't an obvious next superstar, Patty Pimblett with the bowl cut walks through the door. So um, I'm happy, obviously, that uh, that we are the guys, Daniel and I, and maybe Ryan Clark in the future. We got to have him on a broadcast at some no, point. But we're no, the guys yes, charged with no, <laughs> no, John, no. Oh my gosh, we, John, we barely well, want to hey, let him go into the fights. Daniel, could you imagine the suit I would wear if y'all oh. just even if, if y'all just even let me talk before the fights? The suit <laughs> I would have on, whether it's a, it could be anywhere y'all want to have it in the world, man. I will make it. And to me though, like my my, my storyline of the year is the underdog, is the the comeback story, right? A, a guy like Brandon Marino, a guy like Jan Bohovitz, uh, you know, Rose Namajunas uh, coming back after having the belt and the belt seeming to be a little bit too heavy for her, now coming head kick uh, Zangwele early on in the fight and then taking her five rounds and beating her. I've loved to see the, the, the full circle of the different journeys that we've gotten opportunities to see. Charles, Charles Ola Vera, right? A guy that starts yes. his UFC career who, who's struggling, right? And then now he goes on this streak. The streak. He ends up being the, the top submission artist, you know, of all time in the UFC. I feel has solidified himself as a Hall of Fame candidate. You go, you get an opportunity against Michael Chandler. You're down in the first round. He's beating you ground and pound. You come back the next round, knock him out. You get Dustin Poirier, who many of us had decided was the best 155 pounder in the world after beating uh, Conor McGregor twice after beating Dan Hooker and you absolutely dominate in that fight. You take the fight to him from round one to round three when you get his back and you choke him out. And so it was because we've had stars, like if you look at the light heavyweight division, you had John and you had DC and then we've had, you know, Stipe and now it's Israel and uh, uh, Usman. You've had all these people that have had holes on these weight classes for so long. So to see some of these kind of what would be in football called journeymen Rise to fame, sure. rise to stardom, and win the belt was awesome to me. For me, it was it, it, it kind of is in line with Ryan, like watching Glover to share a breakthrough, yeah. watching those guys come through that 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 hasn't had the opportunity, but also just the sport as a whole. Because the UFC has grown every year, like you said, JA, it's getting bigger, it's getting more recognizable. Yeah. And honestly, man, just flying out to Abu Dhabi twice having people back in the arena and returning to fans, like so many different things have elevated the sport this year. And I'm just happy to be a part of it as it continues to grow. Because John, you and I both noticed, like honestly, I fought and became recognizable, but it doesn't seem like anything's changing as you get to the commentary table, because it seems like the sport is only getting bigger and better. Yeah. It's crazy what the pandemic has done for the UFC, and certainly UFC President Dana White was frontal when it came to getting live events back. But this fan base domestically has grown exponentially. Some reports say as much as 40 percent, you know, since March of 2020, when we had our first pre-COVID or last pre-COVID live event, I should say. So, yeah, man, like my twin brother's getting recognized at the grocery store. He's got hair <laughs> down to his ass, you know, so um, – so, yes, I mean, things have changed a lot. I mean, obviously, in Australia, we've always been huge, and that has even ticked up a little bit. So it's a very exciting time for the sport, obviously. And uh, I was just going to say, as the guys who are charged, as me and you are charged with building stars and helping to humanize these athletes, right, look at the great roster that we have to work with, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's truly a blessing. It sounds trite, but it truly is. John, some of the— It's kind of crazy— Sorry, DC. Sorry, go ahead, can, I, can I talk to my new friend? God, oh, me, bro. Oh, you always try to goodness. keep everybody. John, some of the, some of our favorite moments of every fight night is getting the opportunity to see your reactions at the table. <laughs> and you keep it cool, but you also have some fun. Tell us about some of these stories, some of these faces, <laughs> and what's going through your mind when you're trying to continue calling these uh, fight nights. Well, it's amazing that people actually think we're like playing up to the camera. I mean, do they, un do they understand our proximity to what is happening and the results that <laughs> actually are <laughs> happening that, that result in these type of reactions with Rose Nami Yunus and everything else, right? It's a tiny little camera right in front of Joe Rogan. It's complete pandemonium. This is the most crazy, unpredictable theater in all of live sports. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess for me, obviously, as the play-by-play -play guy, like when I first started working with Joe Rogan, it's like, you ain't trying to like step on Joe Rogan, right? As the new guy. But I am charged with 
providing the historical context for these championship moments. Like mm-hmm. when Jan Bohovic shows Jan Jr. him breaking through and I right. say, Poland, your guy got it done. Like that has to withstand the test of time. Mm-hmm. And certainly when Daniel broke through and became a double champ, you know, hopefully him and his family like that call. Right. So sometimes I have to kind of steamroll the guys right. um, just to provide that historical context. So that's, that's all I'm trying to do, I guess, in those crazy moments. May you the best. Ever, I absolutely man. love the moment, John. I love it. It will always play on repeat in my family. And like you said, we are not playing it up. But the one thing that I don't believe people know, Ryan, is we are fans of the game. Like, we love this. Like, every one of us absolutely love being in there. So when you look at our reactions, look at the people behind us. They're doing the same thing. Right. We're just like them. Yeah. So it's like there's no put on. Because the camera's there. Honestly, you almost forget that the camera's there. Of course. You're just enjoying, uh, like John said, the greatest sport in the world, man. And um, I'm happy to be able to share it with not only a great broadcaster, John Ennick, but a guy I consider uh, one of my great friends. John, thank you so much for joining the program. We appreciate John, you thank coming you, on, man. man and such an honor. Bro, can such we an make honor. this a segment? I mean, can we make this a segment yeah, such where an John honor, Anik comes I mean, and brings some professionalism <laughs> to this day? Whoa! Uh, boat. Hey, <laughs> look at how I'm Pleasure. <laughs> Pleasure's all mine. Ryan Clark called Bill Belichick godlike a couple weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. So look forward to shaking your hand, RC, in person. And I do think you could add a lot to our UFC desk at some point. But thank you, boys. Man, thank you Merry so Christmas, much. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. And uh, we will talk to you guys in 2022. Yes, sir. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to John man. Anik, the voice of the Octagon. All right, RC, let's get to the female fighter of the year. We got Thug Rose. Nami Yunus, she was 2 0, defended the belt after winning it. Valentina Shevchenko. 2-0, two title defenses. Beat Lauren Murphy, also won a fight earlier. Juliana Pena, 2-0. Beat the go to Amanda Nunes. How about Marina Rodriguez? Yeah. 3-0, last fight. Beating a Mackenzie Dern, who had all the momentum. And lastly, how about the PFL champion, Kayla Harrison. RC, the winner is... The winner is... The... You know what, DC? I'm not. I'm, you know, you have gotten me into the stories, DC. And obviously, yes. once you once you start to watch more fights, you get to learn about more fighters. And when I'm watching Rose Nama Yunus before the fight, have to have somebody tell her that she's the best, and then having to repeat to herself that she's the best, and then proving to the world that she's the best not one time, DC, but two times. Right against a woman who was running roughshod through the MMA world, who at some point yep. seemed unbeatable for Rose Nama Yunus to not only beat her and take away the belt in dramatic fashion, but then to come back and withstand a five-round fight against someone as great as Zhang Wei Li is. To me, she's the fighter of the year, even if it's not this large amount of fights it's the gravity of the fight what was at stake and how she showed up as compared to her first run as a champion yeah my my, my boy rc man rc guy gotta, gotta say something you be kind of doing your thing a little bit you did your thing yesterday on first take too my boy i watched you i, I watched the whole show my boy did his thing my out dog. there you know but not, hey but right here too rc showing just dropping knowledge after knowledge <laughs> but Love Rose Nama Yunus. Okay. And I like to, I kind of like to pick my friends up okay. before I chop them down. Okay. Because you're wrong, bro. We can give the fighter of the year every year to Valentina Shevchenko. The dominance, right? The dominance, RC. When you dominate, you should not be punished because you rule over a division with an iron fist. And the way that she beat Jessica We're not Andrade, giving Simone Biles stuff because no, she's I, excellent. She should. But she should. She honestly should be the gymnast of the year every year. Every year, year. now you're if right. If that is what she is. Valentina Shevchenko. If that Shevchenko. is what she is, right? You shouldn't be punished for your dominance. And I think at times, because Valentina has been so good, right. we almost punish her for doing it and running away from the competition in the way that she did. She does. And also, this is the first year that Amanda is not up for fighter of the year. Right. So guess what? She hasn't been winning female fighter of the year because Amanda's been winning it every single year. So now that Amanda's out of the so picture, it's, so it's why like a, doesn't is one it, egg get a rose? Is it like is why it like a, a is it like a consolation prize? You're saying then it's DC? Not. No. So like no, you I'm really not, didn't want to give it to her, but you gonna no? Get... I'm saying 
she's been as dominant. But because Amanda had two belts, every year Amanda was getting the the, the, no. the, the award. And so Valentina gets her roses, man. No. She has dominated for years and years and years. Yeah. And RC, it is her year now to stand atop. She's now fun. Bro, could you, you imagine you that for all this time you that can't she's argue. been this good? Yeah, you can't. You can't. That she is I mean, finally listen. number one pound for pound in female mixed martial arts. Not, not After only. all that time, she's number one pound for pound finally. Yeah, not not only did she, you know, did she finish off the year strong, um, she also beat up Holly Berry in Bruised. And so uh, and so I did think watch, I, I did watch hey. it. Yeah, I did watch it. She's, <laughs> she's, she's actually kind of excellent at it. Too. Yeah, it was like kind of <laughs> excellent. Um and so DC, all right, so that is the female fighter of the year. I was right. You are also right, so we'll just both be right on that one. Now, for the male fight of the year, we got Kamaru Uzman. So this is the guy, you get Gilbert Burns, you get Masvidal. Uh, you obviously finished the year with the rematch against Kobe, uh, uh, Kobe Covington. Uh, Charles Oliveira, uh, great with great win over Michael Chandler and then you also defend against Dustin Poirier. Sean O'Malley just doing whatever he wanted the entire year <laughs> to anybody he wanted this to. I mean, it started last year. We had walk-off uh, knockouts. This year, you brutally beat, uh, you brutally win a fight with a TKO in three rounds and then now we see you against Pava. Pava, before the year is out, you end that fight in the first round and not only great style, but showing great skill. Cyril Gaon won the interim uh, the interim heavyweight championship is purely based on skill, based on what he could do. Obviously dominated Derek Lewis and Max Holloway. Fight of the night, both times he stepped into the octagon this year, and he finished that year off with an instant classic against Jair Rodriguez. And DC, yo go, you go first. The winner is... Kamara Usman. But, but, let, let me say this. Let me say this. Let me say this. I did the weigh-in show a couple weeks ago. And honestly, I picked Cyril Gaon because Cyril Gaon beat Volkov. He beat uh, Jorginho Rosenstrike. And then he won the interim championship to put himself in that fight against Francis Ngannou. So I had picked him. But then when I started to think about it and I think about who Kamaru's beaten, how Kamaru's beaten them in the year. Dude, we don't get champions like Kamaru Usman who are as dominant and as long reigning as he is that fight as often. But we should. Because if you're that far ahead of the competition, why not collect the checks? Why not continue to dominate? Why, <laughs> said, why not, not continue collect to the go checks? Right there? Because think about this. He knocked out Gilbert Burns in two rounds. Yep. He knocked out Masvidal in two rounds. In two rounds. And then he had to go to war with Colby Covington. But you don't get to fight Colby Covington over and over and over right. again. So it's like, if everybody else can get out of there pretty quickly, why not continue to go out there and get your money? Kamar Usman this year has not only... Defended the belt three times, right? But he's also made a jump in terms of his profile, yeah, his visibility, his his marketability. Everything is at a new level for Kamaru Usman, and that is only because he went out there and knocked out Street Jesus bad. Yeah, yeah. He beat a guy many consider one A in Kobe Covington again, mm -hmm. and he also knocked out his former training partner after being hurt. Fantastic yeah. year for the champ, the Nigerian nightmare, Kamaru Usman. That's yeah. my pick. And now, Kamaru Usman was was absolutely amazing. And this is one of those, especially when you start talking Usman, gone, this is one of those kind of... Uh, questions where nobody is really the wrong answer. To say Kamaru Usman is the male fighter of the year isn't wrong. It's a matter of opinion. Uh, and I think I'm going to go, and you kept talking about storylines the entire time. I'm going to go Charles Oliveira. And I'm just going to be honest mm -hmm. with you, uh, DC. Think about when he fought Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler comes over from another organization, jumps right in with Dan Hooker, hits him with the explosive left, knocks him out early. Then you're in the octagon for your championship fight, and you're down in the first round. In the first round, Michael Chandler's actually kind of dominating Charles Oliveira, yeah. a guy that we've seen wilt before, right? A guy that we've seen kind of overwhelmed, and he didn't allow that to happen. Comes out the next round, he's stalking, hits him with a left, puts him against the octagon, knocks him out. Dustin Poirier, right? Everybody's sitting around saying what Dustin Poirier now is, that he's now the guy who could be the lightweight like uh, the lightweight champion. The only reason that he isn't the champion yet is because he took the money fight against Conor McGregor. And Charles Oliveira had to hear these things. And this is the dude with yep. the most submissions in UFC history, right? This is the dude with the, with the top finishes in UFC history. And now he had to go put that on display. He was hurt. 
It, this wasn't an easy fight against Dustin Poirier. It wasn't a situation where he didn't face adversity. And to me, it was overcoming the adversity he had to overcome in two huge fights, right? The two biggest moments of his career that he had to work his way back to. Nobody gave those things to Charles Oliveira. And so to me, yep. that's why yep. that's why Du Bronx is my fighter of the year. It's it's so crazy whenever you think about how I want to give it to Usman, but then you start to tell Du Bronx's year and you're like, wow, maybe it uh belongs to the guy that we didn't expect to be here, right? Because right. Usman was already here last year, yeah. but Charles Oliveira, he's not that guy anymore that quits. So right. y'all can all let that go. Mm -hmm. And if you're his opponent and you think that you're going to break him, right. you have completely lost your mind. This Absolutely. dude is an absolute killer. And like I said, the Brazilian Superman. Clark Kent hit the octagon steps. Dude turns to Superman. Superman bro. And that, hey, John Anik said it. That's why they play the game. Yeah. They play the game for Amanda Nunes doing what she did and Charles Oliveira showing He's the best lightweight by finishing Dustin Poirier. Dude has had a phenomenal year. Yep. And honestly, in any other year, Art Ryan, I would have chosen him as uh, the fighter of the year. But it's hard to say that whenever I just gave a whole speech on Cyril Gunn. <laughs> hey, yeah, so he would have been third. He would have been third <laughs> we, on your list. We have, like John said, we have an abundance of riches, whatever that means. I mean, an abundance of riches. Hey, it mean, <laughs> hey, it mean that if we lose some, we got some more. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, we still got some more. I mean, they are fantastic, man. Hey, Ryan, it's time to tap. It's time to tap in. Guys, this is not Ryan saying he has to get to the highest rated show at ESPN right now, NFL Live. He's saying it's time to tap in. It's time to tap let's in. Let's get it. Corporate Jake, let's get it. There were numerous prospects that arrived on the scene in, in emphatic fashion this year, but maybe none more so than Patty Pimblett. So, DC, tap in or tap out that Patty Pimblett had the best performance of 2021 by an upcoming prospect. You know what? I'm going to tap in I think because I, I, I know I, I think I called the fight mm -hmm. but he might he might have been hurt yeah, early he was and then finished the guy yes so yeah I'm gonna tap out I'm gonna tap out actually because he got hurt yep great performance but he got hurt I think I'm gonna do Ian Gary was Ian Gary hurt too yep I think Ian Gary got hurt so yep. I, mean, I mean these prospects aren't listen look you can hate Conor McGregor all you want. No what trouble. What Conor McGregor did, he never got in trouble. Never bro. got in trouble, bro. Right? He was always very clean. So I'm tapping out only because he got hurt a little bit. But still, very impressed by Patty yeah. and very, very impressed by Ian Gary. Yeah. But like I said, R.C. Conor was always clean yeah, when he always. was a prospect. Yeah, and, 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 I, and, and I'm tapping out, too. Um, I think the one thing about those guys is having a Conor McGregor blaze a trail for you gives you a little yeah, bit yeah. more, right? It gives you some more eyeballs. Yeah. It gives you some more ears. And when you do get hurt a little bit and show that you can come back, that's what people want to see in the fighter. They want to see you be able to overcome those things. But for me, it's Alex Pereira. One, because mm. anytime you tell me, right, you tell me that this dude has beaten Israel Adesanya you in any form of combat sports I'm excited right and when you give me the flying knee and it is explosive and it is deadly and it is right on time when you deliver in that way and then I hear things like this dude is made of granite right that's what I'm excited yeah, yeah, about yeah, now yeah. he didn't have all the other stuff that Patty had uh -huh. or Ian had but if we're just talking about the fight and the fight alone, he's the fighter I'm most excited about that's a new prospect yeah. on the block. I made a bit of a mistake, Ryan, and I, I, I unfortunately, let's show this guy. This guy right here, let me try to turn it to where it's very we clear. We see it. We can see that it, DC. Guy, that's the guy that had the most impressive debut for a prospect, but I forgot about it. Like John said, on ABC, it seems so far away. But you remember, Ryan? You remember Umar and the Mega Metal, right? I, yes. And I, I, I'm yes. actually, yes, him I do. taking the guy down and choking him out. Yep. The whole thing, right? I made my debut better than Habib. He did. That's yep. the performance. That's the one. And guess what? He was clean. That's the performance for me that I'm going to say was the most elite prospect I can see debut that. 
in the UFC. And hey, and, and that'll be good, Ryan, because you didn't jump on me. No, for picking somebody. I didn't. Well, on, first, you know what for, well, first, I had to think back to when it was and what happened. Yeah. Right. So I had to, yes. I had to remember that that was even a thing in 2021. This and, year, yeah. And, and then when you explained it, I was like, okay, yeah, I remember that. And and it's actually, yeah. it's actually right. To, to be able to finish that way, but to also kind of have a little bit of wherewithal to know what to say to kind of bring us back yep. to the moment. We, hey, Trooper Jake, we back up, man. Let me know something. <laughs> Follow, following his victorious UFC debut, Michael Chandler channeled his inner Ric Flair finishing with Beat Me If You Can. So RC, tap in or tap out that Chandler's Ric Flair rendition was the best use of the mic in 2021. Okay, so here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to tap in because it became something that took on a life of its own, right? It put it put yep, Michael yep. Chandler in like a different space for us yep, all, right? Yep, this, yep. He was a new guy, he was in here, so we loved it. But uh, <laughs> Raphael, is it Fiziev? Tell me out. Fiziev, Raphael, Raphael, Raphael Fiziev. Fiziev. Hey, Fiziev. The fact that he comes, he calls out Hezbollah, right? And then he's trying to call out Vince Vaughn, but he can't remember his yes. name, right? So he keep asking his homeboy, right? He keep asking his homeboy, wait, 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 what's his name? Was it? And then, his like, name? And, then he, his name? and his homeboy would tell him Vince Vaughn, and he'd forget it again, right? So, he, so he's trying to challenge a man who's made all of these blockbuster movies, right? And I that guess it's good. like supposed to be a cool thing, but he kept yeah. forgetting his name, DC. Right, that was good. Right, but then also he goes, uh, I want Vince Vaughn. I said, you want to fight Vince Vaughn? I was like, I said, wait. <laughs> I go, wait, you want to fight Vince Vaughn? Right. Yeah, it was, that was a, uh, yeah, that was an interesting call out. For me, it was a, uh, it, it's Chan because beat me if you can. If you can, if you can. And then all of a sudden, Flair says something. Yeah. And then Flair's on the interview with him. It just worked out perfectly. And honestly, because of what it led to. Yes. Chandler made the debut. He mm -hmm. had the speech afterwards. And it all came around to him getting a title fight yeah. in his second UFC fight. So for me, it was Chandler. Corporate Jake, hit us with another. At UFC 268, Chris Barnett not only finished his opponent, but he hit everyone oh. with a front flip celebration. So DC, tap in or tap out, Chris Barnett's front flip was the best post-fight celebration of 2021. No, I'm going to probably... I, I, look, it was the sexiest. I mean, it was the sexiest. It was the sexiest what you going with, DC? of the year. But... When Charles Oliveira won the belt and he jumped out of the cage of Houston, ran all around the octagon, and he went and found his family. You remember that RC? Yep. He won the belt. Yep. Oliveira, bro, That's they hard. are so strict. They're so strict on you getting on top of the cage and getting over the cage. Oliveira doing that because he, here's the thing, and this might be what people don't miss a little bit. Oliveira wins the belt mm -hmm. in Houston, RC. When Oliveira spent time in the United States, he spent it in Houston, RC. Oh, okay. So he was surrounded, right? He was surrounded by people that he knew, people that he had trained with before. And the city almost felt like it was rooted in New Bronx. Yeah. So it was like the whole thing, right? Oliveira jumping the cage, getting to celebrate with people in his adopted city was the one for me. Well, it's hard, it's hard to ever ignore the shoey. Right, the 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 shoey is is a very cool yet disgusting thing. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. What that, is that? What yeah, do we miss that? That, that? That's a hard one to ignore. But I'm gonna go with Chris <laughs> Barnett because it was to me just so unexpected. Right, he comes out, <laughs> he's dancing, he's dancing on the way out. And this is a big man, yeah, bro. He good and, too. He can dance. Right, and then but then during the fight. That athleticism that we saw with the flip after the fight, we saw during the fight. This wasn't a, a, a big heavyweight that was only that was only coming out that, that was going to try to bang. This was a dude that has skill. Like, he looks and moves nothing like you would expect a man that's built that way to move. And so to me, to have the intro like that, a performance like that, and then a celebration like that, that's the celebration of the year for me. That was a good one. It was sexy though. I mean, from his Harlem Shake. To yeah, you don't flip, like sexy. You don't like sexy. The boy. Hey, yeah, you do. You, yeah, you, do. you don't. That was good. I mean, I, a little bit. Hey a man, bit. here's right. what I want to say, um, DC. We're coming up to Christmas. We're coming up to the New Year, man. When I get an opportunity to thank God for what I got in 2021, man, you will be a part of that, bro. It has been an oh, absolute blast to work with brother. you this year, man. For real. Hey, and Ryan, my brother, it's been good getting to know you more. You more, you know, outside of the show, 
and the development that this show has shown in such a short period of time, unbelievable for me. And guys, we are off next week. We, we get a break. See y'all until t- yeah, we get a break. We won't see y'all till 2022. But it has been fantastic. Yeah. Getting to talk to my boy Ryan about fighting and everything else to finish out the year. We love you guys. Thank you for the support. We really appreciate it. Man, we appreciate until y'all. Until next time, Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Thank you for the support. Enjoy your holidays, and we will see you in 2022. Peace.